Freelancers, small business owners, consultants, and solopreneurs. Some people are just drawn to working for themselves. I'm Owen Roth. In this show, I have conversations with self-employed folks about their career journeys. Welcome to the Boss's Path Podcast. And here we go. Today, I'm joined by Mike Ripley, owner and operator of Mudslinger Events, aka chief cat herder of Mudslinger Events, according to him. But uh, he'll tell us more about that. Mike, thanks for being here. Owen, thanks for having me. So tell us a, a bit about what you do. Uh, only child looking for uh, friends, actually. <laughs> uh, no, it's, that's kind of a long story. But that's my backstory. I grew up in Eugene uh, in the 70s and 80s and uh, had a paper route, rode my bike, and I put on events for a living now. Um, it's a long way to get here, but uh, for the last 22 years, been putting under on events for Mudslinger events and uh, help organize outdoor athletic or semi-athletic uh, gatherings. And you do two branches, right? There's there's biking and then there's running? Exactly. Yeah, we have Mudslinger Events is the cycling brand, so to speak. It comes from the Mudslinger Mountain Bike Race, year 37, uh, coming up this April. Wow. I think it'll be my 29th time putting on uh, Labor of Love. April for sure. 2024 yeah, is going to be. April. Yeah, always first weekend or two in April. We used to host it. And then Oregon Trail Runs, I started that around 10 years ago, um, just as a way to engage with the running community because they're – Super playful, trail running community is awesome, and wanted a brand that wasn't Mudslinger Events uh, to keep it, you know, a little bit more separate. Yeah, the the seasons for the races, those are, it's all, they're all in Oregon, right? Yeah, all in Oregon. I usually start in March, like spring through summer. Uh, you know, everybody's shy about fire season, uh, deservingly so. So usually everything goes through around July, and then you may have a few events in the fall before the bad weather kicks up. And, uh, you know, we have 14, I think 14 events total um, for the season coming up. So, yeah. And we were talking uh, off camera and before, too, at one of your events that, like, you you do a lot. Like, you're even though the race season is just – right there, you know, in those months, you're doing stuff the whole year. Yeah, there's usually around four and a half months of downtime, so to speak, to where usually in those uh, five solid months of heavy event um, promotion, I'm probably working the equivalent of 10 months of work in those five between marketing and event production and handling emails for 3,500 3, athletes, uh, making sure they have good communication with our staff. We have a staff of eight people, but they're mostly centered around the actual weeks of the event, and they're not as involved with the prep. That's the uh, the cat herder. Yeah, cat herder. Well, cat herding, you only have the cat herd really. My main cat herding uh, duties are during the event, whether it's at the at the actual event, making sure that everybody's on time, on point, because people just, once they get to an event, they park and then they spread out. Yeah. You know, and then they're going, they have to be on a timeline. We want to make sure we're, you know, getting really good consistency for people when they come to our events. But there is a certain amount of cat herding when it comes to marketing and permits and new permit people and all this different kind of facets of putting on an event. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many moving parts. Oh, yeah. yeah, behind the scenes and then in the front of the scenes too on the day of the event. Yeah, but what sizes are these like events? Uh, we generally it's a hundred people to up to five hundred. Uh, usually, we run into field capacity with mountain biking. So if we have a mountain bike event, just to keep the trails nice, we our limits are around five hundred for some events, but some of our events are only around two hundred fifty people. Trail running. We can have a lot more people. Uh, mm -hmm. Gravel, like gravel cycling, uh, sky's the limits. And then it come, becomes a safety kind of situation. We like to keep yeah. it under 500 just because we can, uh, if it makes any sense, filter the event. So if we start out an event with a big climb, the abilities kind of show themselves and people separate out and sure. people have a quality experience. There's probably a lot of thought that goes into how you would design a race. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, some people, you could tell when an event just goes full throttle flat into a trail or something that wasn't really thinking about <laughs> anything. Yeah. I've, been, I've ran in a few events like that, and I've actually participated in a few events like that. And, you know, I don't want to create conflict and aggression. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a time for people to get together as a community, and that's what's really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of thoughtfulness goes into how you design it because you, you want people to good time oh yeah for yeah. sure yeah and you work with land managers work with trail groups work with all different facets of uh, recreation 
um, just to engage in the outdoors. But you've still been able to balance it that like there's still some decent athletes who are coming to some of the events too. Oh, so yeah, you're, totally. you're providing like an experience for that like competitive level as well. Oh, yeah, we, we, I have to make sure that the, the fastest person out there is having an on point experience. Yeah. Because if they do and they're finding the course easy to manage, easy to navigate, aid stations are where I told them they are, everything is lined up, then everyone else kind of follows in line. If you don't set it up for the fastest people, then you're not going to, the mid pack's not going to have a great experience either. Yeah, yeah. So you think about the speed because it's a, a big difference between cycling and running how you would mark a course, how you would, the athletes are slightly different. Mountain biking and trail are pretty similar. Road biking and road running are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. uh, degree of angst <laughs> with any kind of, you know, clientele. Yeah. I think it, I did restaurants also for 26 years, so it was all in pizza. But fine dining versus just going to have a pizza. You know, it's a different kind of yeah, person. Yeah, they're in the same industry, but they're quite different. Yeah, yeah. they are. Some yeah. people are really focused on their pace, you know, their pace per mile, and they want to make sure everything's dialed in, where other people are just like, I'm just riding my bike. Right. I yeah. don't care. Yeah. So, yeah. Or I'm just going for a run. I want to finish. Yeah, it's like me on a yeah. Thanksgiving fun run. It's just like, I'm not yeah. out there to compete. Yeah, you're, like... well, you're justifying your turkey or your your, your food that day. <laughs> yeah. You see, there is that offset, which I think is beautiful about, you know, targeting an event and going to it and doing a little bit of training and, you know, trying to eat a little cleaner or make a little bit of change in your life. That's really a cool thing because I try to do that myself. Yeah. And it keeps me focused. So you mentioned restaurants. Um, why don't you take us through, like, how you got to where you are today doing this Mudslinger events full time? Well, I was an, when I was an only child, I used to tie my friends around the block uh, back when I was 12. And we kept stats because I was an only child, so I had, I had to keep track. And create obstacle courses and all sorts of stuff. So that flash forward, got a pizza job when I was 17, went in the Air Force Reserves, came back and managed. I was actually I managed uh, Papa's Pizza in Corvallis uh, for a number of years until I moved to Bend and opened one up there. And then I managed Tracktown Pizza for 14 years over across from Matt Knight Arena and campus till 2011. And then I was doing racing and working 60 to 70 hours a week at the restaurant. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, so you're, I was doubling like, up. Yeah, yeah. yeah my passion was putting on events, and I had a few ones that people appreciated me doing. And so I kept doing them and had the small little business. And, was, and one of those one of those four events was the Mudslinger. Oh, yeah, Mudslinger. that one's been around. Around, around forever, yeah. Exactly. Since 87, it started in Corvallis. Crazy. And I started helping in 91 when I formed with friends in Corvallis the Corvallis Mountain Bike Club, and we built Dan's Trail. I had the second most hours, like 600 that year. Thank you. I love trail. Dance Trail. Oh, Dance Trail's awesome. Yeah, it was the yeah. first time there was actually a trail where mountain bikers were like, kind of welcome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we're like, we had a, we had like a, a leg that was, oh, fun and rolly. And it was a great reversal. And then it would take a turn, and, you know, but it's still, it was, it was such a cool experience. So, but that was when the Mudslinger was in Corvallis. And then I moved to Bend, uh, worked over there. I was going to help out with an event, but I had to come back because they offered me to, they bought Tracktown Pizza and I ran it as my own. Um, I was the general manager, but they said, Hey, we want you to operate this business. We bought it. It was Papa's pizza that bought it. So wait, you, sorry, I'm trying no, to catch here. up here. You, you owned, you owned it. Uh, no, I actually was run, uh, managing a, a Papa's pizza in Bend, Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Papa's pizza bought Tracktown pizza. Ah, okay. Sorry. I was as just a business asset. Gotcha. So they just wanted me to run it because I was the most, um, I got kind of the redhead stepchild of the company. I wasn't as much into ball pits and, you know, it was, it was cool, but it was neat to go to a campus and back to my hometown and where my mom was and, uh, you know, be able to run that place. And it was a great experience. We went from, I think about 4,400 pizzas a month to about 9,000 by the time I left Wow, a month. And yeah, I, my friends still run it, own it. Uh, and, it's amazing. I love it. I love the football games, taking care of the ducks and 140 pizzas you could push out in 40 minutes. I love the juice. I love it. And we, one time we fed the hospital a $12,000 pizza order because they moved from Sacred Heart downtown uh -huh. to Riverbend and they didn't have a kitchen. So I was really connected to the hospital and doing orders for, you know, a lot of uh, doctors and other kinds of things. And we fed their whole hospital for two days. It wow. was intense. Yeah. Like that 40 batches of dough. That is crazy. Slept there on the floor. 
That's and, like great training for just like any entrepreneurship because you're just like you're learning the grind. Oh yeah, I mean working a three week rotating schedule for 23 years, where you're working four nights, one day off, three day shifts. Yeah. That's your week. That's seven shifts, like 10 hours a day. Yeah. You get a weekend off, come back for a day shift, work three nights, one day off, four days. So for 23 years. Yeah. And having a family, having three girls and all this stuff. So yeah, I, yeah I'm kind of a workaholic uh, when yeah, it comes to that. Yeah. And, but Track Town really helped me learn how business works or – what the books look like, yeah. you know, things that I didn't do when I was going to co- I went to community college for a couple of years um, where I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, this was a good outlet and it was a good responsibility. And I love my time there. So, yeah, yeah. OK. You then transitioned and you that's when you started a mudslinger events. No, it was 2011. So I already had mudslinger events for about seven years. OK, because, yeah, you was doing a couple events a year. Yeah. You know, just the mudslinger and a few other events in Corvallis. Uh, and then bought a series of cycling events in 2012 after I left Track Town, um, the Oregon Grand Fondo. I bought that along with a gravel event from another bike company. They owned these events. So I purchased and got an SBA loan, got my first SBA loan. And that was a cool process, uh, being able to figure out how you dollar cost, uh, you know, an asset and knowing what that means. I didn't fully understand. I just knew I needed to grow my portfolio. And a lot of times when you're going to an event, you're not going to just run into a town if there's already an existing event and just put one on. Yeah. Cause you know, the market's already there. So that was a really, uh, neat opportunity. Is that common to buy events like that race events? Uh, not really common because you would, a lot of times events just disappear. Yeah. Why would you want to pay for it? if It's just going to go away. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can't, people do buy blue, it's blue sky, just like a restaurant. So if anyone knows about, you know, if you're going to go out and buy a business, it's either going to have a building, you might buy the building separate and buy the, the business and all the plans and everything like that. So I bought all the assets of the event production and whether I could have created on my own was I already had a brand Ari had a way to roll into another two events yeah. that have been, they've worked out over the, we've, I think that was, now it's been 10 years or about, no, eight to nine years since that has been all paid off. So those are actually, they're okay, you know? Yeah. They're making it. That's awesome. Yeah. What a, you said blue sky in there. What does that mean? Blue sky is just uh, the value. You don't have a building. It's just. The books. Oh, I see. I just see. the books. It's yeah, like yeah. what the numbers are. Yeah. You know, you. what the revenue is, what your expenses are, and what on a three-year average, what you're making on that, and, you know, if it makes sense to spend X on it or not. Right. Okay. That's the term, uh, he, like, that you would label to a, yeah. a non-brick-and-mortar. Exactly. Business. It would just be blue sky. Just be the, you know, the, it could be a, it's a web domain and, you know, some of that stuff. Yeah. It just goes along. With okay. The, I guess I have a blue sky. I didn't even know. I you do. Yeah, I, I didn't even know this term until yeah. just now. You're teaching me. <laughs> yeah. That's all. It's, trust me, it's an education. It's an expensive education, but it's one. I guess it's life. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's the really cool thing. You left the pizza in the yeah. restaurant, and then you're just like, "I'm going to do this full yep. time." You've got a few more events by purchasing those, yep. and then were you starting to do more events? Additionally, create new events. Yeah. No, I kind of rolled into around eight to ten a year. Um, I had a couple of real large events over in Bend that I'd started in 2009. So they were um, a nice anchor or a nice foundational event. You know, everyone, if you're putting on events, you have to have at least, you know, one a quarter or something like that to be able to make it go. Yeah. Uh, and then also come up with, you know, insurance and paying for all that after that changed, you know, from being able to pay for your whole family for 350 a month to paying for your whole family for, you know, four or five times more, yeah. but still taxes. So it all works out. But needless to say, it's, it's, it's an eye opening experience running a business. That's for sure. Yeah. I know it from a different, smaller side of things, but yeah, for sure. Yep. Where did you get like the help or education or are you just like learning as you go? A uh, really good accountant, uh, talking to people that are more experienced than me, uh, asking questions. Yeah. Looking at bigger organizations and looking at scale Mm -hmm. because it's not 
You're not going to be the, you know, the Chicago Marathon or <laughs> you're not going to be able to jump into doing something like that. And whether you even really want to, I'm not really, don't really care about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that it's, I've always enjoyed being unplugged. And so I want to take people that are really areas that they wouldn't normally go to, which is not the best <laughs> business idea for an event person. Usually if you're going to do an event, you probably want to go to Portland and do an event or Bend. And I have events in Central Oregon, so that's lucky. But you don't start out by going, oh, yeah, I love going out in the middle of nowhere. Everyone else should also. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that that's always been a little bit of a challenge, wrapping my head around the needs of the business versus my emotional needs. Mm. When it That part has been probably one of the biggest learning curves. Uh, what's good for business? What's good for my soul? Yeah, okay. That, that part is – I'm fine-tuning that. You know, the yeah. longer I do this – um, get to be a little bit more realistic and keep things in their proper perspective. So yeah, there's there's a balance there that you're, oh, you're always yeah. like tuning the knobs and always striving. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, some of your events. Uh, I mean, I I shot a video for you uh, for the the Kelma gravel race, and that it's a little bit out. Well, it's not. It's on I five, but it's it's not anywhere near any like huge location down like just past Rose. Well, it's in Southern Oregon, which is could be a different state from what all our pe- uh, most people think of Southern Oregon. It's sad, but yeah. if you go past Eugene, it's like the most people in Oregon, you know, don't go down to Southern Oregon. Yeah, yeah. You know, they just don't, not as much as they used to, but you know, it's it's a, that's a fun time down there. And you have some on the coast too that mm-hmm. are yeah. So, you've you've but then like you said you have some in Central Oregon too where there's a lot of people. So, like you you have spread them around. It seems like you're you're pretty intentional about like having things on the menu for people. Yeah. They want a destination or they want to go to somewhere there's more accommodation. Exactly. And I I like to look at areas that it's usually time of the year and really the availability of the venue. Can yeah. can you have a venue? Is there a possible way for people to park? Is that that whole vision or that whole course has anyone else ever done it before? Mm-hmm. That's exciting. Yeah. When you, can, when you can put something in a place where people haven't experienced it, you're just creating curiosity. And that really gets me motivated. Um, and most of my events, I don't have that because there's not a lot of flexibility in the course. So over time, are they interesting? Well, yeah, they always are because there's either going to be logging or a road's going to change or the new surface. Like at least every every single event has its different challenge. And some of them are not, they don't make me really happy <laughs> because they're more of like, oh, really, that road's out of business because there was a landslide. Yeah. And what are you going to do? You're not going <laughs> to, you can't do anything. Like we've had events where you have to reroute completely. Yeah. Change the format of the event until the contractor gets in there and like fixes the landslide. We currently have one of those going on. Um, or you'll get a new landowner that comes in. They may not allow for an event to happen. Oh. And it could be 10% of your course. Has that happened when you've already, like, you've set a date, oh, yeah. bought, and then, like, you're just like, now I have to deal with this problem? Exactly. Oh, man. That, it be could stressful. be 10%, and you could have ten to $20,000 on the line. And it could be gone. Wow. Even, like, yeah. during COVID, we did seven events that year, and we were, like, the only people to put on events. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Because I just wanted to make sure we people could have a single serve, self-starting, meet out in the woods experience. You don't have to come. We had a full credit. You know, if people could come the next couple of years, we gave them credit during COVID. Yeah. But just being able to operate for my own sanity and for a lot of people was very fulfilling. And so those challenges, if I know far enough ahead of time, it's great. A lot of times you don't know ahead of time. Well, you've been doing this long enough now that I, I'm, I'm guessing that you probably don't stress out as much now as you did initially on one of those like. No, I can't really put too much emphasis in changing something. I just have to be very intentional on coming up with a solution that is amicable to everybody. It has to, you know, it has to work uh, and having some kind of flexibility in my own process to allow for that and communication with people. Yeah, so I know I'm on point because that's the it's probably the toughest thing with any uh, event operator is the person that you're dealing with may not be that person the next year. Everyone changes. C- city managers change, locations, process, every amount of the amount of insurance they want. 
goes up wow. randomly. Mm-hmm. I think it's random. <laughs> <laughs> they don't let me know till I send them the certificate, and they're like, oh, we need another million dollars. I'm like, really? <laughs> you wouldn't have sent me this? <laughs> but yeah. And you ha- so you're always dealing with curveballs all the time. Yeah. But that makes it so that I just work harder and longer and get people dialed in and communicate as best I can. Um, so everybody has a quality experience and you're bringing all the assets to bear on an event, whether it's the city manager, chamber of commerce, the athletes, the local trails association, um, media, everything around. Then you're always trying to educate people on the why this has value, whether it's the local natural area or what's going on in the community that makes the community cool Mm -hmm. um, or unique. Those things are really fun when you get down to having people discover a place, not just because they're coming to do the event, but that little bit of that underlayer of why this community is really vibrant and cool yeah. and livable and why people enjoy living here or what what makes the town, you know, unique. Mm-hmm. So that's that's really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's like the full integration there. How do you approach like a new say you like, okay, I'm gonna do a gravel race. I want it to be at this time of year in this relative, say the coast or whatever, Mm -hmm. how do you even take that first step of, how did you find the template to figure out, oh, how do I get a race event going here? Like, where's the first step? Oh, just talk to travel association. Yeah. You know, just go talk to the city manager, just go ride your bike. I mean, it seems (laughs) kind of, I mean, it seems kind of, but it still takes, right. It's, it's a big, if you're valuing your time, most people may want to get into it, but they, I gave up my full-time job and my retirement and all these other kinds of things Yeah, where maybe I could have, uh, if I had to go back in time, maybe I would have did something and kept my top four events and really focused on this or grew certain aspects. But then I wouldn't, overall, you end up in almost in the same spot. So if you're going to create a new event, it, it's pretty, it's not that hard it's just you still have to develop a website. You still have to develop all these different layers mm. that you don't – it's just it, – it's really a hard question to answer because yeah. if it gets it. me to – well, no, I mean it's, it's, it's a scary thing because if you go into it, either you just go into it. And I, I've told people that I'm wanting to get in events. If you have $5,000 in your pocket to set on fire right now, go for it. <laughs> I'm just on a basic level. Yeah. If you just want to torch 5000 bucks, that go for it. And develop a whole lot of gray hair probably too. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, whatever. You're probably going to do that in your normal life. You know, like uh, I always was – always drove me crazy in restaurants and probably everybody can relate unless you're working on paperwork in the afternoon or something. It's 2 to 3 o'clock and there's no one coming in and you're just standing there and you're like, there's nothing to do. I'd rather be doing something else. Yeah. You know, so on. But you do have that security a lot of times. There is that. That's your security time. You know, your downtime in the middle of the day if you're working, you know, for a company or something like that where you're, you know, there's always going to be a certain amount of time that you're not going to be super productive. Sure. Uh, but I think that when you come into a community and you know, we have a really good following, when you can create a really good product and you can duplicate that, not just to duplicate it, but to make it interesting or Look at how your how it is for the. We have events that are in there t- anywhere up to sixteen years that've been going on. Or Mudslinger's thirty seven. I've been putting on twenty nine years. I don't know if I can make that race any different. It's just what it is. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of time, especially with new technology that comes out. I can probably make a uh, route work where it wouldn't have worked before. Or I can go to an area that doesn't have an event, but they may have some grant money or marketing money, and they want to get more exposure for the cycling community. And they'll come talk to me and say, hey, would you want to be able to put on an event here? And then it's about the time of year, and we can't really overlap with hunting season. It always gets to be the hardest thing about fall, which for good reason. Sure. You know, so there are all these challenges. Yeah. For sure. It just seems like so much to just balance in your head. I mean, there's know who to talk to, form those contacts and relationships and manage those. But then you've got all these other factors. You just mentioned hunting and and then uh, and then the factors of like the landowners. And there's just so many things that like have to play in. Have you ever tried to start organizing a race and events for somewhere and then realized it's just like logistically isn't going to work or maybe even like monetarily just isn't a good business decision. 
uh, based oh, on. Oh, for sure. I, I've, I've spent a half day on mapping and looking and contacting. Or people contact me. They want to do an event or I have, especially I have a lot of riders that they'll want me to do X and they just want me to do it in their area. Yeah. You know, or they, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Yeah. And, or why am I scoring the something this way? Or why, what you could tweak this. And I don't get a lot of that yeah. because I still produce a consistent, you know, it's a consistent product. People like it. That's interesting to hear about uh, how like you've, you have a lot of people coming to you with ideas. Like you said, riders who are racers. I, f- I feel like I, that's been a little bit of my experience in the business side too. Uh, now that I'm, just over the past couple of years of just like realizing that you need to just like let those voices and opinions kind of like roll over you and you don't need to like necessarily absorb them. And like, sometimes you can't like, you, you shouldn't process them and think of them. You should just like, just like kind of like listen to it and not pay too much attention to it. Cause it's just like, that's someone else's idea and it doesn't actually make any sense for what you're trying to do. Right. Kind of going off on a tangent here, but from, for me personally, I've there was uh, times where like people would come and say, "Oh, you should try doing this type of photography or what have you," or "This would be a great idea. You should try and do this." Right. And I'd be like, "Oh yeah, maybe I should." And then I would just look into it. And I'd spend way too much time and energy trying to do it. And then later, I'm like, "Why did I listen so much to that one voice? Like, I should have just like not. I should have just listened and then not acted on it." Right. Yeah. Right. That's been a big learning experience for me. It's tough. I mean, I I know these people though that are talking to me. They're f- they're friends. Oh yeah. yeah. No yeah. no nothing. Right. I, I've had friends do the same give, thing. Give me the same thing. Oh, really? And like, but that, I think that that that's been dangerous for me is because like I put more weight into it. Because I'm like, oh, this is someone who I like and likes me, and like I'm gonna listen to their idea, and and then I spend too much time on it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I mean, I I'll do the same. Like I'll put out. I put out. I guess got done with the survey and asked the question. What other race have you done or event that have you done that where you saw something that mudslinger events could add or do better or that you like better about what they did? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and just to give me some feedback on something that you they found that was uh, really cool or a unique thing. Could have been a different food that offered after or mm-hmm. the way they marked the course or I don't know. could be anything. Sure. But if you don't put yourself out there for people to give you really good feedback in a way that – it you can consume it, what you need to consume. Okay. That's the, yeah. you know, there is a certain amount I need to consume, like how people travel, like the amount of money they spent coming to a race, how far away, some demographics on, you know, how many events they're planning on doing, things that are just allow me to function or if they're not participating, why? Yeah. It could be kids. They only do one season. They only are allowed X or Y. Because like in cycling, cycling is 80% male or 75 to 75% male, whereas running is pretty much 50-50. The longer the distance, it tends to go male if you're going up like 100 milers and stuff like that for trail running. Mm-hmm. But women crush on most of my events when it comes to running. Uh, they're social. They get together. Uh, most all my events also for cycling are – I look at it from the lens of the person who's planning the family activity, and that's usually the woman. Yeah. So if I can make her happy or make the person that is that planner in the relationship happy, mm-hmm. then I'm way more successful. Yeah. And it could even be like in trail running, the color scheme on some of your merchandise or oh, yeah, or yeah. all the stuff that has a vibe and a feeling. So um, – those things are how you're being thoughtful. I think that's really important mm-hmm. uh, that everybody – I come at it that and my whole business is wrapped around everyone deserves to have a good day. Mm-hmm. And that makes me happy as a person. So I think that is where if they have a good day, then it, it has a residual effect. And then I leave it at that. Whatever happens in the in-between times of the, you know, my brain and my contact planner and everything else I have, uh, yeah, thanks to Google, uh, <laughs> then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Same thing with, uh, we'll probably talk about how AI is going to change things. You know, it's, it's changed, changing my business already, you know. Oh, well, let's talk about it now. What, how, how is it changing your business right now? Oh, I think I get to rethink about how things are presented. 
you know, I can put in a, you know, I have chat GPT. I know that that thing grew. Like it took Instagram like three or four years to get to a hundred million users. And that got chat GPT got there in one year. Yeah. That's scary. Crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, I know scary versus crazy versus what people are, you know, they're just looking for perception. And so being able to take a technical guide and, and throw things through or be able to ask a question and have basically just confirm what you know as time changes or as, you know, things come up, it'll be just, I find it more interesting. Like a lot of the things that I do, I try to find the interesting point of the event or what I can do a little bit better. And so I'm looking for ways that it just has value with AI. Okay. So have you found anything at this point in talking? Just text, just basically updating tech guides and looking at a different way or perspective to um, write something. Okay. Could be some, a, you know, some kind of a, a manual or a way that I'm constructing an email when I'm trying to get the athletes. Like I have a 24 hour relay over in Bend, uh, the Oregon 24, and teams of uh, their solo teams of two, three, four, five, six to ten camping, like 700 people that are coming. Mm -hmm. So looking at how I'm asking those questions when I send out about pre-event emails, throwing it through a, you know, AI yeah. may just help tweak it or helps me follow up on creating uh, templates, you know, things that yeah. are just really static that are maybe just really arduous for me to just come up and, or hire somebody out to go and proofread all my stuff. Mm -hmm. I can at least get to a place where I can proofread the AI, which sometimes it's like, nah, <laughs> it's not my voice. Yeah, and so then it, you know, it's almost like I want to put an AI challenge to my uh, my athletes. Which one's me? You know, <laughs> they'll probably figure it out. But I, you know, yeah. it'll be kind of fun. But now I find that stuff. I find the way that life is moving right now to be pretty fascinating. So yeah, yeah, it definitely is that amongst maybe other things. Oh, depending on way the other things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's really interesting, though. I know we were talking about this just before we started recording, but like, uh, from that little snippet of the conversation we were having, you were talking about how you view like the importance of having in-person events, which is what you do as like almost gaining value as like the world becomes more like online oriented. Can you touch yeah, on that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's critical. I, the only thing that after, especially after COVID, it was really apparent that people at an event, uh, we did a self start in Cottage Grove for our half marathon and when the people showed up that March, it was like, think of 21 to do the Redux event, but we had to do like the protocols, the mandates, all that stuff. So yeah. people came in there. They were almost like, you could see it in their eyes. They weren't even unsure if they should be there. Yeah, yeah. They were in like their own PTSD. And that that's not even been really talked about. The PTSD of COVID. I've never even heard it being brought up. It's the most insane thing not to bring up. Right, yeah. And people are shook, you know, or they were. Some people still are, sure, but they're just being cautious, you know, <laughs> whether they're being shook. Um, but it was really fascinating to see how they got done with that. And there was like a weight took an, taken off their shoulders. And so that's the part about in-person events. Politics don't matter. Nothing really matters. People show up. Yeah. They're all love their bike or love to run or love being outdoors. It's synergy. Mm -hmm. And the way that social media and every system that we have to divide people and to gamify people and to marginalize people. Yeah. So those things I find to be very destructive and I'm not down with it at all. So I think having the in-person, I think everyone should do that because they get to meet a new friend. They get to take the edge off. They get to have some mental health, some physical health. They get to have endorphins. They get to forget about all the stuff they're being fed. Yeah. And just for dollars. If they don't know they're just being played, that's – they're literally what, what is happening. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the event, not whether you're coming to my event or going to somebody else's event, it's a chance just to reconnect with other people. Yeah. You know, that's important. And from my little glimpse into your events, like you you have some people, like you have your Triple Crown, which is a gravel yeah. yep. a gravel bike race series, and it's got multiple. How many races? There's five. Five yep. currently. Yep. Oregon okay. Triple Crown. I noticed uh, when I was filming for you for one of them mm -hmm. that like – the people like are pretty much anyone who's a lot of the people who are racing in one of those are racing in all or a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So there's like that sense of community. And I saw that camaraderie between like some of the racers who were just like, Oh, you know, 
they like they're talking because they know they've like raced this multiple races over this year and probably multiple years. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that that sense of community that's being built by putting on these. Oh, events. totally. No, you you build a family. Yeah, and everybody comes from different backgrounds. You know, uh, mm -hmm. there's just so whether you're up at the front of the pack or you're in the back of the pack, you're just allowing people to come in and find their space. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I don't know. It's just so, it's so unique. And I don't know. I can't even explain it. It's like, I get, I have such a really cool feeling when people are successful. You know, uh, I was really stoked about making pizza and like people were happy and really you can engage with them and they, but they loved what you did and I created different pizzas and they came on the menu and you know, they're the other kinds of things. So that was cool. Yeah. But this is, this is, it's just, I don't know. It's something special. Like we have a hundred mile event where people, we finish 88% of the people, but it's a hundred miles in one day. So it takes an incredible effort for people to tr train up to do it. Yeah. And we have the highest amount of women that participate of, you know, most any endurance event in the nation. Wow. Uh, yeah. Like you know, sometimes up to 30% are women. Yeah. And women expect success. They don't just wing it uh, versus men where they'll just, eh, whatever, That's I'll figure it out. You know, <laughs> women don't do that at all. They're, they're, they're pretty straight money when it comes to uh, not wanting to get jaded or you, know, you want to know what to expect. And I respect that. Uh, I have three, three daughters, an awesome wife, and yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're straight fire. I, I don't get my way at home. Uh, <laughs> gotta kind of hide, so <laughs> I can't I can't cat herd them that well at all. Um, but yeah, it's just that joy of everyone having a shared experience. Yeah, you know, it's like a good meal. Like when you, you people used to eat more together at restaurants, or they'd have you seen the family style seating. Yeah, which kind of blows people away now. People would freak out, you know. Yeah, if you had a round table, oh, yeah, you're sit sitting over there. I mean, they, I guess they kind of do it like what sojis or the where the the Japanese food where they, they'll, they'll make stir fry at your table or something. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, I can't wait that long. I don't know. It's just so fun. And then when people are done and you know, the great thing about events where are longer events that are anything from say 40 to a hundred miles, especially on the bike. Yeah. Somebody will finish in three and a half hours. Somebody will finish at six hours, about five and a half hours in, we'll have the awards Everything's filtering, coming back. Everybody's having food. Everybody's relaxing. Everybody's families are there. Everybody's getting to say hi to the pe person they saw yeah, yeah. on their bike. It's it's a memory that's going to last a long time. Yeah, you know, it, it's really, really a heavy, heavy, impactful thing for people to have those types of experiences. Yeah, and. We just don't have a hundred miles of grocery shopping or, you know, uh, taking the kids to school with a group of parents, you know, uh, that's a field trip, I guess, you know? Right. Yeah. So it's, it's just those unique times that, and it's, you know, I value that because people's free time and they're going to actually spend their money and their time coming to our family's events. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. really cool because time and money are not something that's readily available for everybody. Uh, we try to donate entries or if somebody last year, I think probably gave away 20 or 30 entries to some people that would advocate for them. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And they'd say, Hey, we have a group of people, uh, I had a good friend. I won't say his name. He's for the uh, BIPOC, um, community mm -hmm. and they wanted to make one of my gravel events, kind of their center focus for their group, but we really didn't know how to market it. I'm not going to market it, you know, because that's just tokenizing or you right. know, saying, yeah, it's yeah. like whatever. And yeah. we have honest conversation about that. Um, but it was so cool because they got to come to an experience where they didn't know if they really belonged with a traditionally, you know, European type of group. Yeah. yeah. Just totally dialed in and they just had a really awesome time. So, and it wasn't much risk for me. I just want to make it available. Most people are probably sure. too afraid to ask, you know, but yeah. that was a cool, that was a cool thing. That's really cool. Yeah. I actually hadn't ever thought of that. The whole, like, you know, the way that biking might be viewed from the outside because I'm, you know, probably part of the demographic that would bike, not that yeah. I race, but you know, right. You try and open that up to people who are outside of the traditional. Oh, totally. They ride bikes because, I mean, like Oregon Triple Crown is 50-50. 50% 50, 50, 50 of the people want to have a fast time as possible. We always offer two courses. And if you sign up for the longest course, you can size down at the first aid station, which makes people able to, you know, and we'll rescore them for the shorter distance. And we don't have abilities. Mountain biking or 
traditional road racing, you have this whole hierarchy of ability and oh, it drives me bananas. It'd be like it'd be like having a 10k and if I'm I'm 56, but if I was in the 55 to 59 year old age group, but I was running against an Olymp- ex Olympian. Mm-hmm. Well, no way I should be able to have to run against him, right? <laughs> Cuz he's an Olympian. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, but that's 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 the part of like racing. I put, I I have racing in my events, but you know, our, our slogan is more than a race. And it's really about having an experience and just finishing what you start. Yeah. Whether you're fast or you're slow or mid pack, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but getting over that persona, especially in biking, there is a little bit of a stigma that goes into it. Whereas in running, people just have shoes and they may go to a running store and they're like, they know where the 5k is. A lot of people in cycling, they generally don't race. Where I, Mm -hmm. you know, I attempt to bridge that gap where, you know, I'm providing people space just to know what their experience or what they can get out of it. They got to make the decision whether they want to pony up and have a good time or not. Yeah, that's interesting from a personal stance. My personal stance is like I'm I bike, but pretty casually. Sure. Uh, But yeah, and I've never now that you say it, I've never actually thought about racing. And it's probably because I think of like race is like, oh, it's competitive. Like I'm not a competitive person in my biking realm but um but yeah it's it's interesting to hear that you've you've thought about that and you're tailoring it as uh an experience not just like yeah oh we're just here to compete exactly i mean i have cutoffs at the aid stations yeah. you know that's to save everyone because we do get people that are like way in a, they come sign up for an event with six thousand feet of climbing and they may have only climbed a thousand feet of training like at one time and one ride. Yeah. They get out there and they're like, uh, I'll get a radio call. This person <laughs> is walking their bike <laughs> up the hill. I and mean, it rarely happens. Sure, yeah. But we do have to put in some cutoffs just course, so yeah. that, you know, because the weather and everything else. Yeah. Uh, and you can't be out there for forever. forever with, so, yeah. It, with your, yeah, your yeah. staff and all that. Exactly. So you, that's the part where we're kind of part tour because we have full aid stations with mechanical support and we have food and we even have the ability for people like with the Oregon Triple Crown and, and most of the events that are longer where we'll have drop bag service so they can have their own their own container that they'll bring and label it and then we'll bring it out on course for them and then bring it back. Mm-hmm. So people with dietary restrictions and so on and so forth can still, you know have their own support out there where we're just providing the nuts and bolts of making sure that they come back in one piece. Yeah. Again, you're just touching on another element that you've thought of all of the, all of the pieces that go into the experience. Yeah. You're not just like laying out the course and be like, all right, here's the course go. It's like, no, you're thinking of like all of the logistics. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important, especially I I look at too, as a West coast thing, maybe, I don't know, maybe more so it's me. West coast people have pretty high standards. In a lot of things, coffee, beer, everything. And so mm. I I have high standards for myself where you can do a lot of new events. I think you, if I was on the East Coast, the population density, some of my friends that put on events nationally, oh, man, they crush it. Put on anything. There are so many people that are doing events, the population. Where in Oregon, we don't really have anyone on the Pacific side, you know, uh, no state, you know, it's kind of a unique place to travel to, you know, if you don't have a really good crowd from Portland and Bend in the local area, uh, I think 70% of our people that come to our events are from Oregon. Um, Bend, we get more people out of the area. So you really have to be on point, you know, because there is a lot of opportunity for people. I love Oregon. I mean, the fact that you can go drive or go out your backyard Mm-hmm. And go on a really quality experience. Yeah. Most any place, we're so fortunate to live here. Oh, yeah. You know, that I think is the desire of people when they come here. They want that kind of Oregon experience and to be taken care of or that hospitality. And I think that's super important. Yeah. Well, you're doing it. So, yeah, yeah. still. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of still, what do you see for uh, like going forward in the future? Do you plan on expanding? Do you plan on? continuing to do it like what, what's the future hold for for you uh i trying to come up with a business plan for the next three to five years you know trying to see what that looks like that's a hard question sure um yeah i've tried to i've asked other people you know it's everything's a work in progress right now i mean i i want to continue what i'm doing as long as i'm healthy enough because you know it's a very laborsome job you know whether you got a tree out in the woods you have to chainsaw out or whether you have to work on 
loading your trailer and hauling seven gallon water containers around. Because you're not just like as no, I'm not some admin. people might think that you're just like admin, yeah, computer no. stuff. But you're you're out there, like you're marking courses, you're yeah. you're doing all of the on the ground well, stuff. People have real jobs. <laughs> I can't find anyone getting somebody on a Friday. Oh my, that is tough. You know, finding uh, a mechanic that also is really good at customer service that wants to make you know. 20 bucks an hour or whatever and get a hotel room paid for and get some event gear and, you know, just have a quality time. I'm gig work. You know, we yeah. I think we, you know, we, we have eight employees, some are admin. They do um, work on some of the tech guides and some other stuff. Uh, and the other people, you know, may come over and help me scout out a new loop and help me trim back some of the, you know, road. If the road hasn't been used in a while, we'll go out there and clear the road and, you know, take some loppers and make it more, you know, clean for riders to negotiate. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, it's a lot of, it's heavy on the me, which is fine. Uh, but it's not for everybody. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, you have to be a person that, you know, is not afraid to go out there and, see what's out there yeah well, run into a dead end road <laughs> workaholic like you said self-labeled yeah. earlier but it's kind of good work yeah. though i mean hey if you're if yeah. you're getting if you're getting technically paid to go on a bike ride to go check out a course not bad yeah i think that's one of the things about like self-employment is just like if you if you can met there's the opportunity to meld it into like what works precisely for you and you can let that what you enjoy inform your business and vice versa and mm -hmm. kind of like try and slowly line those things up as close as possible and it sounds like that works works super well i think the key thing i do maybe that may sets me apart at least from what people have told me is that i'll tell the athletes to text me like leading into the event if they have a burning question oh really oh most event directors run away i was gonna say that's... they don't want that how are you able to respond to this like because that guy's gonna be around yeah, it's gonna annoy me when it gets to be too close to the event. I mean, I love him, but I mean, it's like the guy has a burning question. He hasn't figured it out on the website, so either I'm not doing my job by providing answers. He hasn't yeah. read the information. Yeah, because I get stats on how many people open the emails. Mm -hmm. So I make it like eighty percent of the people have opened the email and read the pre-event information. Now, hopefully, they've come to the event. They just no one wants to see another damn email. Yeah. I mean, that's literally, you know, it's just like anything. Sign up for this, and eh, no, don't do it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we try to make sure that we're communicating effectively and try to make sure that the week of the event, if they're taking that time, especially if they're coming to a big event over in Bend and they may be spending, I don't know, a thousand bucks on their family accommodations or maybe their whole vacation in the, yeah. in the case of a few of our events, uh, that's super valuable. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, they're supporting a lot of people that are working, you know, uh, at restaurants and everywhere supporting brick and mortars sure. that come to there. And so I still think travel and tourism, especially going into 2024, uh, is more important than ever to get people engaged in the economy of the community um, and the vibe. I think that's what everybody, hopefully, hopefully other business people that are in any community can, I would say, cross pollinate each other, you know, try to look at what they're doing and amplify uh, the, the whole health and vitality of the community. Cause a lot of people that are coming in just really appreciate that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, everyone helps feed everyone in that way. They do. And most people just trying to you know, getting that, understand what they can do. Like when the, our system is where we have a voucher for food. So mm. it could be, it's 12 bucks. That's what it's at for this year. So everybody that comes to the events that especially for, the, uh, for most of my events, they'll be able to use them at local restaurants or they can use them the day of the event. So if they have a family member uh, that's hanging out, they can go use it at a local business. So it allows them to at least, you know, and I'll pay the local vendor based upon how many vouchers they get. Yeah. Which is neat versus just having, oh, here's your catered meal. Yeah, yeah. I get somebody from outside the town because no one in the town has the availability right, of yeah, doing yeah. anything because no yeah. one has staff. And so that's been a really cool thing. That's super cool because, yeah, you're – and then, I mean, there's probably people who come from out of state, out of Oregon. Yeah. And then you're plugging them into the community. Say if it is in Bend, you're coming and they'll, like, go to a local restaurant. Yeah. yeah. And we'll put them yeah. – we always create a – we have a Google Google venue map. So we'll put all the businesses that are participating on that map. And that has the most views of anything because people are just getting the lay of the land. Yeah. And they don't know who's involved with the business. They can always find their own thing. But then we'll just try to create – an itinerary for them, mm -hmm. suggestions. 
Yeah. And see how that works. It sounds very similar to like if I've, when I've gone, you know, nowadays when I go to friends' weddings and they're like on their wedding website page, they'll have like all the lay of the land of the, you know, all the businesses and things to do in the area while you're there for the the weekend. No, totally. So, so. That makes sense. Weddings, I mean, that's all that stuff. I mean, it's, that's, yeah. know, that's probably a lot more stress being a wedding. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, it just, yeah, that's yeah. what came to the top of my mind. When right. No, totally. That. Yeah. Man, your your Rolodex must be uh, your contact list must be huge because like you've you you probably have to go talk to all those restaurants as well as everyone we've already talked about. Like yeah, it's I mean, it's, like, it's 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 a lot, but it's all in it's compartmentalized. You just have to attack that list yeah. because you're going to get a response, and you have to manage the response, and then the after action, and then yeah, so. You just want to communicate in a time that allows for other parts of your business or other parts of your activities to, you know, thrive. Yeah. Not just spin in a circle. Because at a certain point during an event process, you just that part's done. Whether it's sponsorship or your pasture permit date or a new landowner comes in. Cause if you're being very intentional, it could be any business, then you're basically ahead of the game. You know, not maybe some people don't like being too ahead of the game. Some people send stuff in in December. They're like, well, we don't need this till January. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I didn't mean, I, that, I'm just trying to get done with it, really. Yeah. And, you know, so there is a certain time where I, I, I do attempt to try to take some time to be a little more selfish with my time because uh, that's what I've learned is that you're only as good for people in your family or in your friends or for yourself if you don't take that carve that time out during the day to be switch gears or to shelve something but come back to it just in analyzing where you're at because especially when you're self-employed you really you can just do a b and c and that's kind of comforting but being able to carve something out for a project it could be a new event or a new way to do things or some education or studying something about or taking some time to read an article um on anything could be anything it does with business um i think that's important to carve that time out or hey at that time you don't want to do something business go goof around yeah go do something fun try to be playful i'm i'm trying to get back to that where i give myself more space you know and tacking things more and even if i work 12 hours in a day in the off season just to really go at something and take some breaks in between mm-hmm. Oh, if I can take care of like a big, like I can get all my pre-email templates done for 2024. Sounds like no fun. It, it's really not fun. Yeah, yeah. It's, you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I'd rather not pot shot it. Like if you have 14 separate events, you know, I'd rather just go at it and look at how they overlay and see if the, my communication was effective and see what I need to do and just make that space. Mm-hmm. But then the rest of the day, if I'm going to make that effort to sit at a laptop for six hours straight or seven hours straight – which I know a lot of people do that around their regular daily business and their you know backs are probably more jacked up than mine is <laughs> uh, they're still giving themselves, oh, now you get permission and you want to go and you're going to have to do something fun for the day. Like you're balancing it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I'm trying to find more balance because I think that that's the, or I know that that's the part where it gets to be a little daunting is where you're getting to, you're getting too close to your event date and you're not, you don't have some of this stuff that's, like just refining what you've looked at from the year past and not trying to overreach. Because right. a lot of times I can make a list of five things I may want to do, but maybe two things are only realistic right. for the year. And really looking at what it would take and not saying, okay, do I need to hire that out, those other three things? Or can I really accomplish those? Mm-hmm. You know, and just being realistic, you know, trying to get that life work balance. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, uh, and maybe I'm just assuming here, but like early when you, you transitioned out of the restaurant, which was, you're yeah. spending a lot of time while you're getting started also doing a few races as a side project. Right. And then like, I'm guessing you probably didn't have as much time then. And now you're more, a little bit more established. So you're able to I probably had a little more, I, I don't know, I had more time there. I just didn't know how to, how to work with it. Oh, okay. When I was moving around because it was a different business. That one was already really established. Yeah. So now I have to fill the void. Mm. That's a challenge. Yeah. It still is to a point. Um, I only have, I have like four, really four months of off season, four to five, but you really still have to fill that void. Some people might think that's easy. I'm like, I never want to be retired. 
Because literally, if retirement is just like what watching TV or like you know, just I don't know what it really. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And so maybe I'm not a good candidate for it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe in my future, I'd love. I think I would love to do consulting. I think that would be fun. Oh, yeah. I always thought it'd be cool to be a mediator, also. Yeah, I think that would be really that. fun. I think it's challenging because I, uh, I just think it's funny how people can't come to you know some kind of an end result that may not accomplish all their goals, but you know it may be the healthiest or the best you know outcome of something. Yeah, you know I could totally see you doing that. I mean, you've you've got the skills for it, and like you're you're good with people. Stay well. in school though to get the degree though, so I'd be harsh on so quick. Maybe, yeah. Uh, you know? Probably, it, but... I have if, to go to get that degree in communication. That's the secret right there. It could No be. one ever says that's a good degree. I don't know. I harsh gonna, on anyone that, anyone that has a communication degree. I love you because uh, I think that'd be... A, I wish I had that degree in a way. Just because I communicate so much, I figured, eh, if you communicate really well, should you get the dang degree? Where's my honorary degree? Yeah. You know? I don't know. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that kind of thing, though, is less... Less valuable. It's less important now than it was. Uh, you're right. Re- like even fairly recently, I feel oh, like it's more. Yeah. It's becoming more of a world where you just like prove yourself through what you do versus like your um, your resume. Uh, yeah. And who you know. That that it does too. matter. That, it still matters. That's always going to matter. Yeah. I think that's the thing about socials. I'm trying to get. Uh, we are. Uh, Working on this with a group I'm part of, we're trying to come up with some more socials as part of our group activity. Like socials meaning social outing? Yeah, just connect people to other people. Like if you're trying to move a project, everything like you were talking about is so siloed up that unless we get back to getting together after work and talking to other people that may move a project forward, no, nothing's really going to move because yeah. people have their budgets and they have their way they do things or – a lot of companies hire outside marketing companies. Everything's canned. Nothing's really organic. It tries to appear to be. Yeah. You know, but yeah. people aren't really talking. And that's the thing I think that's really, um, really important with business, especially small business and how it relates to, you know, the people that we employ or the people that we serve, uh, how that whole, uh, that whole ecosystem I find that to be uh, the biggest opportunity, I think, moving forward as we get enveloped in tech is how we break out for really honest discussions on, you know, the way things are actually going. Yeah. You know, I think those things are really important. I guess that's a good point to pivot to what advice you would have for anyone who's considering a path of self-employment. Oh, boy. Keep your daytime job. (laughs) <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no, really, it's it's like ask yourself, you know, if you're if there's a need for the brand, the service, whatever you're doing, mm-hmm. um, what's your backup plan or do you have enough cash reserves to get you through six months or a year if you didn't have to work? Yeah. Or you have a partner that's, you know, um, financially able. You see that happening a lot. Um, there's a lot of guys that think that go into entrepreneurship or they're. Their wife is, you know, partner is like got a really good second job, you know, they got the benefits and so on and so like that. So, yeah, if you got your basis covered financially, it's just, you know, if it if it moves you and you really want to do it, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, any kind of self-employment. I mean, I think it's insurance is pretty easy to navigate. You know, you shouldn't be so fearful of that, you know, unless you have really if you're not in good health, that would probably be the biggest concern I would have with being self-employed. Yeah. Is if you're, you know, because it is like I'm 56 between my wife and I, if we had the goal plan, it's like $2,000 a month, $2,200 a month, where it's $1,300 for the the lowest plan, which we have because we have a health savings account. That's a big thing with self-employment is the insurance part of it. Yeah. Easy to obtain. It's a tax. It's a function of taxability. So, I mean, it, it does pencil out but that's kind of honest take of it it's worked out okay yeah um our kids are older now so we don't have to worry about that but those things help your health uh um where you the biggest thing is that if you are a person that feels like if you don't go for this now you're going to look back with regret then just go for it yeah you might as well swing for the fences yeah that's i did that because, you know, it, literally, I, I didn't want to be in the same position. I wanted to see what I could do in the event world. 
Um, who knows? Maybe I'll get a big pizza trailer and do that on the side hustle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I miss pizza in some ways. I you can know. tell, yeah. 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 But uh, I think as long as you have those bases covered, you know, and just hopefully you've worked in a place where you understand the amount of money you need to spend per month on running your business. Right. And keeping it viable and not ignoring your brand and what its mission statement or what its value is and looking at those things because a lot of people will put the fact of like making money over the fact of establishing your foundation. Mm. And, you know, me, it was all pie in the sky dream, you know, trying to, and did a lot of things myself where I probably would have been smarter hiring a few things out, getting a quicker leg up. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the time with three young kids, I, I didn't, I I was trying to grind it out. But I think that that really is, if you really want to go for it, you're in your, a lot of people do this. I think when they're in their thirties or they're in their forties, there's a lot of people today, they're, they're starting out right away. They want to be an entrepreneur. They're going to go for it. And everybody has a certain skill. I like people. You know, that's, that's where like my main thing is I like helping people. I want people to see people have a good day or I want people to be able to help themselves, you know, be self-sustaining. Right. So, uh, that part, I don't know where that'll take me, you know, uh, it, it just to be a mystery, but unless you kind of explore that, that's the, that's the really important thing I think is that even establishing your own LLC, it's not rocket science. No, that's easy. It is. The insurance part of it, the general liability, all this, yeah, the nuts and bolts, the articles of incorporation, and, you know, find a business attorney. You got a little bit of extra cash, do it the right way. You know, form it. Um, and then see where it takes you. It's anything. It's it's enriching your life. I mean, you'll, you'll figure it out what you like, what you don't like. It's a pretty low-cost spend when you, you think about it is going down that line because you can always pull the plug. You always work for somebody else. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so... But if you're a person that wants total security and you want that, you know, at the end of the th- time and you're fine with that and you've got to – people need you and you're great. That's awesome. But, you know, I, I don't know. I just like breaking out of the bubble. Cool. Well, yeah, that's that's great advice and you've you've definitely thought about it and had a lot of time to learn and think about it more over your many years. Of- yeah. It's like who would want to hire me now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's what everyone says. No, literally, I know. It's like, like, it'd be kind of funny. I want to go put a resume and say, like, I'll get a callback or something. and be like, I don't get a callback. I'm like, what the heck, you know? Yeah. What? I you do know? wonder about that, though. I don't know if that would be true, though, because if you're like, yeah, you wouldn't have any, like, employment resume, like, but on your resume for the past, whatever, it's yeah. been Ten years. decades. Yeah, yeah but, decade. uh, but, like, you'd have, like, you're like, oh, I ran like mudslinger events for like this many years, and look, look at all the things I did. I feel like someone would jump at hiring. Oh, they but... probably think I'm too much of an alpha. I <laughs> take over the place. <laughs> I got called a race bully. Really? Oh yeah, that was a good one. Wow. I know. Wow. I know. And the Walmart of cycling. The Walmart of cycling. That was so much cred. I was like, wow. I told him, I go, if I could ever make as much money as Walmart, I will donate to any charity you want. Uh, as much as you want, okay? That was funny. It was between a friend. He was, giving, he was throwing me shade. It was pretty funny. <laughs> like, That's so funny to hear, like, people's perceptions of, like, what, like— oh, No, because he how's... maybe he wanted my life or something like that. Yeah. You know, he was just kind of envious, like, you know, like, oh, well, you got it made and this and that. You just turn on a light switch. I mean, and there's—I mean, I guess there's something to that. I could totally ignore everybody and turn on a switch. You know, yeah, but you've, like— But, but, you, but you've—A, you worked really hard to become— Sure, the Walmart of no, oh, yeah, well, I'm not the Walmart side. I know, yeah, I right, know, just no, but yeah. air quotes here. Yeah, but, but and yeah. then like B, like there's also a lot of work, even though it's you know the uh, you know what you have to do now because you've done it for oh, so yeah. long. So, but you still have to put in a lot of work. And I feel like from the outside, your friend and maybe other people, they can just look at it and just be like, oh yeah, Mike's life is easy. You and, and I just, need to franchise my brain. We need to get this event, this the thing, and just put it into a box and like. Go global. <laughs> it's insane, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not the guy to talk to. We'd have to go that. find people that are like high energy, like myself, and like, oh, f- there are people out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? there's, there's other people. I probably had like ADHD as a kid and undiagnosed. It was all the hostess products. <laughs> yeah. That's probably true. I went through my hostess product. I was a very, I was a husky kid. Oh, really? Husky. Okay. Looked like a Coke bottle. It's like a 5'9, 190. Wow. I know. Is this, and I guess that's a good thing you discovered biking. I got then. tall. 
Yeah. So <laughs> you grew up. Yeah. Oh, velour was all the all the rage back then. So <laughs> <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't make a comeback either. You know, kind of sad. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Um, okay, well, uh, that being said, uh, last thing, how can people find you, uh, like, if they want to sign up for a race or learn more about it? Yeah, um, at mudslingerevents.com uh, or Oregon Trail Runs for a, a couple trail runs that we do during the year. Uh, at least locally, we have the um, Spring Fling up at Alsea Falls and Mary's Peak Trail Run, which is epic. But, yeah, Mudslinger Events and Oregon Trail Runs, that's where you'll find me. Awesome, Mike. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation awesome thanks owen yeah yeah all right and there you have it this has been a really fun conversation with mike hearing about uh his business and his life and just general thoughts um if you want to hear more conversations like this please subscribe and follow the podcast until then this has been the bossless path catch you next time <laughs>